is uh, our next podcast, webinar, whatever you want to call it, video on uh, strength for today, bright hope for tomorrow, God's vision for the next chapter of the United Methodist Church. Uh, I'm Bishop Sue Hoppert Johnson of the Virginia Annual Conference, and we're continuing this series as we as we strive and dream together about what United Methodism looks like in the next hundred years. And I have two fantastic guests today, two dear friends, folks I've admired for a long time, uh, and folks who have spoken to the heart, I think, of what matters to United Methodists, Dr. Paul Chilcote and Dr. Steve Harper, uh, both longtime friends. And I'll let them talk about their histories and where they come from. But for me, I really want to start with uh, how do United Methodists approach Scripture? Because I have gotten letters from United Methodists. I've gotten letters from church council folks who say, well, we believe in the inerrant and infallible word of God. And I'm thinking, you're not United Methodist. I don't get where this is coming from. Uh, not to say we don't have a very high opinion of scripture. I know my life every day. And I, Steve, I remember years ago when we were on the Board of Ordained Ministry together in Florida, you said to me, um, Sue, I think we have United Methodist clergy who don't read the Bible every day. And you were just horrified. And I said, I know that's the case, Steve. And so <laughs> I would I would add to that horror. I think we have United Methodist lady who don't read the Bible every here's, day. Here, here's my old worn yeah, out. How do you, if you say you value scripture, don't just, you know, give me five verses that you've been handed on a, on a script. Show me your life. Show me who you've been formed into. So yeah. how do we as United Methodists approach scripture? And why has there been this big divide? And I'll start with you, Steve, because you wrote a great book a few years ago called For the Sake of the Bride, where you really gave us an alternative view of scripture, especially when it comes to LGBTQ folks. So tell us how, how we as United Methodists should read scripture. Well, Bishop Sue, first of all, thanks for the opportunity to do this. I mean, I'm I'm seeing your face and Paul's and seeing my own, and, and it, it just kind of cool to be able to spend this time with you. Uh, I know Paul well enough, and you too, I think, that uh, we want this to be uh, fun, and we want it to be humorous in some places, but we want it to be honest. So let me start with my honest response to your question. Those who say that people who disagree with them in matters of human sexuality or matters of scripture in general don't believe the Bible, that's just a straw man. That's just not true. Now, here is what here's the way I respond, and then I'll stop and let Paul uh, you know, agree or, or take it some other way. I think that we do interpret scripture differently, but we hold scripture, the authority of scripture, uh, pretty much in the same place. And what happens in the debate is that you begin to confuse authority and interpretation. Right. I've, I've been on panels. I, I don't even take, you know, 30 seconds to say, yeah, we don't read that text the same but I believe it as much as you do. I just happen to believe it for different reasons than you do. See. So I think part of the teaching task in the emerging United Methodist Church is to help people uh, get the knots out of the net. We have conflated ideas that don't actually fit. And one of them is, well, if you don't believe the Bible the way I do, you don't believe the Bible. And I say, yeah, I do. I just don't read that particular passage. We've got to differentiate between authority and hermeneutics. And we've not done perhaps as good a job as that as we should have. Yeah, I couldn't agree uh, more, Steve. Uh, again, and for me too, Sue, thanks for the opportunity just to share this time with you and those uh, who are listening. Uh, you know, I, I want to go back to the origins of our movement uh, for a moment and think about scripture within the early Wesleyan movement. And, and I'm going to make a simple distinction. It, it feels like a binary, and I don't like binaries, but I'm going to, going to say what I, I feel I need to say regardless. You know, there, there are people who I think natively view Scripture in a static way. So you have words on a page, and those words on a page can only have one meaning, and that's the meaning they've always had and always will have. Yeah. On the other hand, there are Christians and Methodists who believe that this is dynamic, that, that the word isn't something that can be confined into simplistic uh, ideas or propositions. There's a dynamism about it. 
So even in Wesley's hermeneutic, to, to play off of uh, the term that Steve just threw out, his way of interpreting scripture, it, there was a, a, a duality in that. He believed that scripture was inspired by the Holy Spirit. That requires a lot of explication, obviously. But he also believed that the current community or the individual who's engaging in that scripture is also being inspired by the Holy Spirit. And I'm sure listeners can think of countless uh, times in their lives that they've read the same text. And at this particular time, it's as though that text comes to life because yeah. it's the living word, because that text is so intimately connected with something they're experiencing or an issue they're trying to navigate. And all of a sudden they have insight that comes to them through something that's dynamic, not static, interrelational, always growing, always moving. Um, so I think, you know, I, the, one of the issues is we have people within the United Methodist tradition, the church today, who are all across the spectrum mm -hmm. in terms of how they interpret scripture. Radical fundamentalists mm -hmm. on one end of the spectrum. And I would have to be honest to say even some who somewhat somehow discount scripture. They're, they're all within Methodism. But I think our origins and the Wesleys give us a real dynamic view of scripture that that can be real for us right and in a, our re real day real life yeah and a discipline as to i read it every day it shapes me it teaches me about the nature of god christ's love for us how god interacts with human beings but you know i think back of all of the the church has had to change and interpret and move. I mean, huge arguments about whether Jesus was fully human or hu fully divine, huge arguments about predestination, hu huge arguments about pacifism versus war, right? That we've never fully, I mean, you certainly have pacifists in the United Methodist Church and warmongers, right? Mm -hmm. They interpret differently. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and a lack of consistency, because I think once you acknowledge that you see where the Holy Spirit, and for John Wesley, you know, the Holy Spirit in his own mother prompting her to preach. But the sense that we've moved, you know, clearly scripture has some nasty passages against women or saying they should be quiet or saying they have no authority. But the Holy Spirit showed us otherwise, and we discern that. Early in my ministry, I had a couple come to me and say, what does the Bible say about genetic testing and artificial insemination? Well, yeah, yeah. it does, you know, <laughs> but, yeah. but I, we immerse ourselves in scripture to know the nature of God, the love of God. And then we, then God gives us the creativity and the Holy Spirit and the mind to discern what's wisest given a whole new set of circumstances. So you know, there's, a, there's another, so, ahead, sorry, Steve, there, there's another principle within our Wesleyan heritage related to scripture that I think bears directly on what you've just said. And that is, with regard to those difficult texts, with, with those texts in Scripture that sometimes seem to be contradictory, we can't quite sort them out, then you go to what Wesley described as the general tenor of Scripture. Right. In other words, what does, what does the whole narrative of Scripture uh, demonstrate to us? And without question, the central themes of that large narrative are first and foremost love L love governs all all other interpretive lenses uh, that we use and a love a love that gathers in right yeah, absolutely gathers in, gathers in the roman centurion gathers in the absolutely. leper gathers in yes. the Syrophoenician woman gathers in the samaritan woman at the well gathers yes. in the ethiopian eunuch gather i mean you just go yeah. through well, just for the sake of the podcast, I, I feel a little moment to mention Dr. Tom Ord, O-O-R-D. Mm -hmm. um, he is speaking along with some of the others like Paul on a theology of love right now. And to study the theology of love, Tom Ord is a, is a, is a, uh, a good voice. Good. It may be somebody you want to even have on a podcast sometime soon. Here's the thing that strikes me from an historical point of view, and then I'll, I'll turn to Paul because he's really the historian. We've been held hostage for almost a decade by people who claim that we're not orthodox. Mm. 
my historical response to that, and it's kind of tongue in cheek, is as soon as you say the word orthodox, you're about 400 years behind the Bible. <laughs> So if you're wanting to go to the Bible, we got to go past orthodoxy. Orthodoxy captures you in a moment of time, freezes that dogma in that moment of time to make it look as if it's unchangeable. That it's, there, there's a difference between the canon as foundational and the canon is fixed. Some people treat the canon as if it's fixed. I treat it as if it's foundational. And that brings back then to Paul the idea of what do you do with the problematic text? And I'm not going to repeat what he just said. If it's foundation, you see, then, then you, you, you don't leave scripture, but you bring into scripture tradition, reason, experience. That's why we have the hermeneutic that we have. We're not Bible only people. Right. Uh, that's and, not and our neither God. neither were Lutherans. Well, exactly. Now, now, the, the, the Lutheran Reformation and other reformations of the 16th century use that phrase sola scriptura, scripture alone. But when you look at what the reformers actually did and how they approached and used scripture, it was never scripture alone. It was always engaging experience and reason and tradition, right. uh, that, that same quadrilateral dynamic. Paul, wasn't it Albert Outler who said sola scriptura should be scripture ultimately, not scripture only? Isn't that the way he yeah. says it? Oh, yeah. In the 70s, sometimes, Steve. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Quite a while ago. Right. Well, so one of the things, one of the things this conversation has, has reminded me of, you know, when we think uh, it was it was our earlier com earlier comments a few moments ago about doctrine and uh, and how doctrine functions for us. I'm working on a new book right now. It's actually a follow-up to Praying in the Wesleyan Spirit, mm -hmm. which is which in which I translated 52 of John Wesley's sermons into prayers. Mm -hmm. So I'm doing a sequel volume to that called More Praying in the Wesleyan Spirit <laughs> because there are 151 sermons. So there are yeah. 52 yeah. more that I'm now looking at. And one just yesterday was on the Trinity. Mm -hmm. Okay. So here is here is a sermon on the Trinity, and if you don't mind, I, I don't like reading on in podcasts, no, no, no. but I think it's just so relevant. Uh, he says, "Whatsoever the generality of people may think, it is certain that opinion, and here he means doctrine by opinion. Mm -hmm. that, that, uh, I could exegete that, but he means doctrine here. Right. That doctrine is not religion. No, not right opinion, assent to one or to ten thousand truths." Mm -hmm. This is a wide difference. There is a wide difference between them, even, even these right opinions, um, so distant from religion as the East is from the West. Mm -hmm. Persons may be quite right in their opinions, do doctrines, and yet have no religion at all. Mm -hmm. And if I were to read further, what he points to there is the absolute centrality of relational love. The most important thing for Wesley is not dotting your I's and crossing your T's when it comes to doctrine properly. It's living in loving relationships with with God and with others. And yeah, and I when would argue, I would argue that's what Jesus did. I mean, I'm thinking of his sure. his diatribe sure. against the Pharisees where he said Absolutely. You, you tithe. You, you know, you, you tithe on mint and dill, you, you do, you've got the rules down, but then you're whitewashed tombs, right? Now, no wonder he got crucified because you don't call religious leaders whitewashed tombs and get no. away with it. But no. his whole point was you follow all the rules, but there's no transforming into love. You are not good. And, and you were, you know, I keep going back to Jesus's notion uh, he always told the religious leaders he talked about stumbling blocks right you were keeping people mm. away from yeah. their own relationship with god so i'm going to tell you a little story and then just have you comment on it because this is my fear one of my college roommates came to visit and um she's a person uh who's who grew up secular in germany she has really no religious stake in the game very devout person in the sense of very moral very upright very loving but really has no religious underpinning and she was with when she came uh, we were having a discussion and she got really serious on me she said i need to talk to you about something i was at a reunion of several of our friends she said 
And I mentioned that my son, her beloved son, who is going to college, came out as a gay man. Mm -hmm. And she said, one of our mutual friends who's Southern Baptist, her, her husband's a pastor, said, well, you know, that's an abomination. And first of all, my friend has no idea what an abomination is, but she knows no. it's not good. That's her the only representation she gets of the church and of mm -hmm. Jesus. And as I talked to her, all I thought about in the back of my head was Jesus' discussion of a stumbling block. Because if ever a stumbling block was cast in front of a human being and will forever keep them from Jesus and the church, that was a major one. So how do you address that? How do we not see these attitudes as a stumbling block to keeping people from from connection with Christ and his church? Well, that's a, I mean, that's a huge question, Sue, and I see it on multiple, multiple levels. Um, the, the first thing that it's not a direct answer, I'll be honest to, to that question, but what comes immediately to my mind is what the current division in the church um, means to the world. You know, when, when they see what's going on in our right. church, uh, what is the witness uh, of the church to to the world in that sense? So how have we become a stumbling block in in that whole area? Sure. Um, you know, I Steve Steve said it earlier, but I think in the end, virtually everything in these contentious issues within the Christian family comes down to where we started here today, mm -hmm. and that's in how you approach and interpret Scripture. What the issues of authority and the issues of interpretation. And I think Steve, Steve, in some ways, in his um, um, his book on love, Holy Love, uh, deals with some of those in, in a really concrete and a practical way when it uh, comes to the issues related to sexuality, human sexuality. I'm sure you have more to add to that, Steve. Well, I will as Sue uh, wants me to. I, I want to stay with your story because uh, that's what's on my mind right at the moment. And I would agree with Paul. I, I'm thinking about your friend or people like her that I have come to know. And I say come to know because I, the first thing I realized in my evangelical bubble is how many people were outside uh, of my frame of reference. The, the, the greatest gift, I'll go on record today with you and anyone, the greatest gift I've been given in the last decade is the gift of LGBTQ devout, you know, disciples of Jesus and healthy human beings. Mm -hmm. Should have said it the other way around. Healthy human right. beings first. Right. They aren't aberrations. And then second to that, living their uh, authentic selves as fully devoted followers of Jesus. That's the greatest gift I've been given. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking about your, your friend. And Sue, I think I would say, I mean, I'm about to say it, so I guess I would. We, we've got to start with respect. Mm. As soon as we say, well, yeah, I felt like that once, but now I'm, you know, I'm so much more enlightened than you are. I mean, we've got to watch what we say from the get go. Right. Because they're already raw in their soul. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you've ever, you know, cut your finger, if you pour alcohol, that's a good thing to get the germs out, but it's going to sting like crazy. So we got to be careful that even our well-intentioned responses don't sting the sensitive hearts of those people who've heard and put up with far more in the Christian faith than we think they have. So I'm, 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 all I've done so far is read a review of a book called We of Little Faith by a woman named Kate Kohler. I'm looking at it right now, I called it up. I'm almost, this may sound strange, but I'm almost more interested in hearing what the nuns and duns have to say than what the Christian theologians have to say, because I think there's the, there's the Velcro. We've got to stick to them. We, we've been expecting them to stick to us. Say, it, as soon as you're like me, we can really get going. Right. I don't think the gospel goes in the other direction and says, we're going to stick to you. Prevenient grace for God's sake in the right. Wesleyan. Right. And so I, her, her book, I've got to maybe get it, but I've read an extensive review. It's just, she says, I don't believe in God. But when you read it, you end up, I'd say, I don't believe in that God either. Mm -hmm. now, I think she takes it all the way out to the ontological sense of, you yeah. know, is there, I, I don't go that far. But 
a lot of people I've talked to in the last 10 years is I don't think I believe in God anymore. And I say, well, what kind of God do you not believe in? And when they say, I say, well, neither do I. What else is new? Yeah. yeah. Um, what, what ultimately led you to see differently? I mean, you talk about the evangelical bubble. You were president of Asbury in Orlando. Um, Paul was on, on faculty there. Yeah, indeed. Uh, what mm -hmm. what have you learned and what would what have you gleaned because you've had time now to reflect on it and and through some really rough times but what have you learned and what would you like if anything could crack through that community what would you like to say okay here here's i'm going to try to do this quickly mm -hmm. but in a way that you know you can extrapolate sub thoughts the first is that i still believe across the board, the evangelical tradition, not the hijack tradition by Christian right. fundamentalists, but the evangelical tradition that Richard Foster and others talk about in his book, for example, Streams of Living Water, I still believe that my theological education had more positives than negatives in it. Mm -hmm. And so what I do when I have the chance is I try to be respectful of the tradition I chose to live in for 30 years. Right. Nobody forced me to. I made conscious intellectual choices that, yes, this is, and many of those, most of them, in fact, I would probably continue to affirm. Uh, Gushy's book, After Evangelicalism, he and I have emailed back and forth about that, and it's just, it's a transformative book. Now, in that bubble, I'll stay with the word bubble since I used it, mm -hmm. I, think I, I think I was exposed to two kinds of teachers. And let me divert just a moment for somebody saying, you know, when somebody will say to me, well, you know, you're just you're, you're, you're just listening to the wrong people, Steve. And I want to say, did you come up with your interpretation of Leviticus on your own or did you listen to somebody? Mm -hmm. uh, did you were you just reading it and said, you know, I bet you had a Sunday school teacher. I bet you had a professor in a conservative school, you know, who, who put the idea in your head that's now become your doctrine. See? All of us learn from somebody. So as I look back on my experience, I think I learned from two kinds of evangelicals. The first one that I would be willing to go back to are the ones who like me, and I, I, I can't let myself off the hook exclusively, but you'll know what I mean. I, just, I didn't, I don't think some of the people who were teaching me an, a non-affirming theology of sexuality were, uh, were intending to harm anyone. That they had been taught that they believed it, so they passed it on to the next generation. And I happen to be in that number. Now, I also believe if you've got a person with a PhD in biblical languages and historical studies and systematic theology, some people kept me from knowing things. May I make that sound a little more sinister? Right. I think I'm not going to name a single soul. Right. But I think there were people who could have said in class, but, you know, there are other ways to look at this, but they didn't. And not only did they not say there are other ways to look at this, they gave the impression that to look at it in another way was wrong. So you ask, my discovery uh, was largely around the fact of just realizing there's a credible scholarly, historical, long-standing hermeneutic of human sexuality that's different from fundamentalism. That's it in a nutshell. It's out there. We've, but certain people have made it appear that it's not out there. It's been out there as long as the conservative. In fact, some people will allege it's been there longer. That this post-enlightenment uh, conservatism is actually the new kid on the block. That if you really want to start rewinding the tape, you're going to end up in an inclusive church, not an exclusive church. You know, I um. Sue, so, before ahead, before we move on, let me. Uh, there are two things that I have in mind that I, I'd like to say, and the first, kind of as Steve did a few moments ago, I want to go back to your story. Um, and uh, there's method in my madness here for a moment. Just hang with me. So, in terms of that Southern Baptist friend. Um, I would I would define the nature of the response that you narrated there as fundamentalism. So that there there is a fundamentalism at work, and we know that fundamentalism isn't a theology. 
it's it's a worldview. Um, and it's a it's a worldview that basically says, I'm right or we are right, and everyone else is wrong. Mm -hmm. And nothing can change that. Right. And I just have to confess that in the multiple efforts that I've made over the course of my life on the current issues and previous issues, I found that, re quote, reasoning with a fundamentalist is an absolute dead end. Mm -hmm. it, it goes nowhere because right. there is no way to penetrate that fundamentalist mindset. Mm -hmm. So I, I just want to put that out there. And say, as as Janet, my wife, has always said, you cannot change anyone but yourself. Mm -hmm. You're the only person that you can change. So that puts the impetus on me to, to read my heart, to know my heart, mm -hmm. to respond to that fundamentalist, not necessarily in an argument right. th that's never going to work but by simply bearing witness to the truth that you embrace mm -hmm. and be, being authentic and having integrity. So I just wanted to say that, to throw, to throw that out. The second thing that I wanted to say is that the, the trajectory of Steve and my life, uh, the tra trajectories are very different. Mm -hmm. um, and yet Steve and I came to a, a place of really deep friendship now over many, many years despite the differences of our life trajectories, my life began in, in, in the parsonage in, in a pastor's home. My father deeply entrenched in Boston personalism. So, so uh, for the, for the common listener to this, Boston personalism was the basic expression of classic liberalism within the Methodist tradition. Mm -hmm. So I grew up in a, in a classical liberal home with a strong emphasis on ethics. That was something that was part and parcel of that, of that heritage. Um, and then I fell in love with the Wesleys. And that created, the proper term is, some cognitive dissonance for me with that inherited liberal tradition and that new you know, evangelical, Albert Outler said to say Wesley and evangelical is a redundancy. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. if you're Wesleyan, you are evangelical. Now, again, that takes a long time to, to you know, exposit what, what that, that all means. Right. But you get the point. So there was a there was this bit of a collision. And quite a long time in my life, I never knew whether I was an evangelical or not. Mm -hmm. um, and and um, so the, these are complicated life narratives. Mm -hmm. uh, we have, e each of us has our own trajectory our own path that we follow. Uh, but what I do want to say now is what I've experienced more recently in my life uh, is a reclaiming of that mm -hmm. classical liberal foundation mm -hmm. that was a part of my earlier life right. Right. and not jettisoning mm -hmm. my Wesleyan, um, uh, my, my embrace of the Wesleyan heritage right. either, right. but holding those together. Uh, because I do believe um, that there is a, a proper a progressive Wesleyan perspective. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the things that um, I'll just say blatantly and fairly honestly that irritates me is the hijacking of Wesleyan terminology. You know, one group claiming we're the only Wesleyans. Mm -hmm. You know, anyone who believes anything other than this is not Wesleyan. Right. Well, what is that? That's another form of fundamentalism. Mm -hmm. So I want to affirm there are multiple Wesleyanisms. There, there are different emphases within right. different streams of our Methodist family. That, that's why we have the Nazarene Church, for example, right. that came out of the holiness tradition, because it viewed Wesley in a different way. Um, so there are multiple Wesleyan traditions. I simply want to, to, to make the point that a progressive Wesleyan orientation is just as legitimate mm -hmm. as any other form of Wesleyan interpretation. Well, and I think, um, you know, yeah, I think that um, the, the my experience over the last six years, seven years, I'm disturbed when you overlay what I love, Wesleyanism, 
evangelicalism with fundamentalism, mm-hmm. right? Oh, there, the, that yes. has been to me the hijacking of the church. Yeah. Absolutely. Anytime I see, we are the only right people. We are the only orthodox, and everyone else isn't just wrong; they're a danger, right? So then it becomes they are the defenders of the faith. And I've seen this. We're the defenders of the faith. We're on the point of the sword. Okay, let's make it violent. And because we are so right, it is up to us to destroy what is wrong. And that is scary to me. And the other overlays, the overlays um, that, you know, We've got to protect the church from the danger of gay people. We have to protect the church. Now, it's interesting to me, they can't go back on women clergy. But yeah. that certainly is not part of fundamentalism, because then you have to use a different interpretation of Scripture, right? But that, to me, has been the most horrific thing, because I am, and you guys are, we are evangelicals. We believe that Jesus is the light of the world. We believe that the Holy Spirit is the force behind all this, and if the, Hor- the Holy Spirit isn't at work, we're dead in the water. We believe that, um, you know, in the hope of the resurrection, resurrection power, that resurrection is now and can revive anything, that is who we are. So when I see us painted in ways that say that is not true or we don't believe that, um, I get really frustrated. Yep. And I think, Paul, To get, I think progressive is a word that people just, they use to just pound others, right? And I would just say, instead of a progressive Wesleyanism, I think it's a Wesleyanism that recenters itself on the gracious outreach of Christ, Mm -hmm. right? That there is a grace here that, that underlies everything. And you know what makes fundamentalists mad? My observation, because I've talked to hundreds of them these new Wesleyan fundamentalists, when you say to them, I disagree with you, I might be wrong. And they get angrier because they want to fight you, right? They want to have engagement. It's like, no, we disagree. That's okay. This isn't the heart of the matter. We're not discussing resurrection. We're not discussing lordship of Christ. We're not discussing the authority of the Bible. We're discussing issues and matters that it's okay for us to disagree on. And um, it's not necessary to split the church to save yourselves. Yeah, you touch you touch here, Sue, on a, you know an issue that's really central to my own thinking, and deeply rooted in our Wesleyan heritage. And that is there are, there are essentials to the Christian faith, and there are what Wesley described as opinions. Right. And the the issues over which we battle today, I simply, in my own heart and in my own conscience i cannot elevate to the level of these being dividing issues um so yeah you know i we, we, we've talked a lot i, I hope I, i'm not um uh, too it, too directive we... <laughs> too, too directive here sue we've talked a lot kind of diagnosing the problem and, and the issues right but i'd love to pivot to hope yeah you know about, and about and to the future hope. and to what um you know what's on the horizon um, and what are the kind of discoveries that we're making in the life of the church today uh, that really will will feed a future filled with hope? Yeah, and I don't know me, if you want, right want to now, point us that I wanna, way. I want to show Paul's book. That's not yeah. coming out very clearly, but Multiplying Love, mm-hmm. A Vision of the United Methodist Life Together, Paul Chilcote. Uh, I highly recommend it to you. And uh, we'll give you some of Steve's stuff uh, in the Steve, we'll, let, we'll talk about Obadiri later. Yeah, but yeah. Um, Paul, let's talk about what the new, the next chapter of United Methodism looks at, looks like, and how we can be the gracious uh, experience of Wesleyanism in the world. Yeah, I, I was given the the marvelous opportunity to speak to uh, the Leadership Institute just this past week up at the Church of the Resurrection uh, with Adam Hamilton there. And um, followed, um, I was kind of closing the evening and followed a marvelous uh, panel of three of our uh, United Methodist bishops talking about uh, the future. I'm sure that's on, uh, that's recorded and on the Church of the Resurrection's website, if anybody would love to take a look at it. 
Yeah, but that evening, the, I, I just focused on three very simple things, Sue. Um, grace, hope, and love. And all of these, the, these three central pillars um, are just absolutely central to our Wesleyan heritage. Um, I would go so far as to say is that this is what the Wesleys were rediscovering in their own time. You know, grace, in, in my way of thinking, is quite simply the ways in which we experience God's love. Grace is the, is the mechanism by which God's love becomes real for me or for us uh, as a community. And, you know, the central tenet of, of Wesleyan theology is that we're surrounded by God's grace. We don't sin. Calvin says we sin because we're devoid of grace. Mm -hmm. And Wesley's view is absolutely opposite to that. Right. You know, we, we sin, if we want to use that particular language, we sin because we don't engage the grace that is already surrounding us in the ways that are most helpful to us and to others. So gr grace is a platform for us. Um, and I think it was Tom Langford many years ago and Jim Logan at the Wesley Theological Seminary who wrote together this wonderful, wonderful kind of a pamphlet more than a book, Grace Upon Grace Upon Grace. You know, our, our, our theology, our way of life is deeply embedded in this God of grace. And the way I like to explain that, too, is, is using the image of embrace kind of like Miroslav Volf, you know, that, that God has an amazingly wide embrace. And there's a collect of the uh, Anglican tradition that says Jesus stretched his arms out on the hard wood of the cross that he might take the whole world into his loving embrace. This is what the future church, I pray, is all about. Right. You know, a, a church with wide embrace that takes the whole world into its loving arms. I, I, I'll stop there. I, I, no, well, what, you, what, you say what, something in your book that I really appreciated, and that it is, you know, when we read about the early church in Acts, one thing we're told is that they, they found favor with everyone, right? Everyone was enriched, not just the members. They were held in high regard. And what you point out so, so well in your book, Paul, is the church is not held in high regard now. Right. by people not in the church That's right. yeah. and we brought it on ourselves yeah we have not I think one of the things I say in the book is we've not found a, a way to express the love that we've experienced in Jesus and, and the loving God we know we've not found a way to express that mm -hmm. to people outside our community um, and that's that, that's a pretty harsh indictment in some ways, but it also what, once we acknowledge that that that's not we've not done well with that, so that so that when most non-churched you know nuns and duns uh, in our world today, when they look at the church, they see number one judgmentalism and second hypocrisy. Right. You know, so we we've got to do a better job of, I mean, dare I say loving people <laughs> we, we need to love people right. yeah <clears throat> Steve, you want to weigh in yeah i want to continue the conversation not repeat what paul has already said so well and what he says by the way uh, in the book even more than what he's just said um i think multiplying love is is the book for our time i just really do I'm going to just say it to anybody who may end up watching this, that um, this is this is the book that will join others. It's not going to be a standalone, but it is an early offering of a vision that that will will move us into becoming the kind of new United Methodist Church we long to be. Now, <clears throat> piggybacking on that, expanding on that, I would just simply say two things. One is just. I'm writing some about that myself on Obadiri in a series called The New UMC. And as soon as you or your tech people can just put the website address, that's all I want to say about that. 
Okay, good. What I want to say now is breaking news. This is something I've not shared with anyone anywhere. And so you run the risk of saying it you know, prematurely. I've been focusing on Jesus's words, uh, uh, follow me and I will make you become fishers of people. And I've thought about, I usually think about the fish and I usually think about evangelism, what, what makes for good evangelism? How, how do you, which side of the boat do you throw the net on and all that kind of stuff and you know, all that. I'm starting to think about the part of the verse that I've, that I've for some reason or other ignored. And I'm thinking about the nets. Hmm. Um, Jeannie and I were walking along a little path in Rota, Spain at night. And uh, we walked down to this ocean, to the Mediterranean Sea. And there were fishermen mending their nets. I haven't thought about that in a long, long time. I'm thinking about it now because the two things I remember specifically about the nets, and I'll, these maybe I'll think of others, as, but one was they were having to tie together things that had come apart. Some of the some of the strings were broken, right? But they needed to be retied. So part of it was retying. Some of it was getting knots out of the net. That in the process of of you know doing fish work, the net had still gotten knotted up. My my vision of the future of the United Methodist Church is largely parabolic at that level. We've got to tie together some things that have become untied. And we've got to get some knots out of the net. I early, at Almost the beginning of this, we talked about the need to separate authority and interpretation. See, those have gotten knotted up. Or maybe, and maybe even tying together in that earlier part of the conversation, the fact that you can love the Bible and still not read it like, see, we got to tie that back together again. Right. Yeah, you need to be immersed in it if you yeah, love instead it. Of being falsely <laughs> accused, it. <laughs> instead of being falsely accused. So apart from what I'm writing occasionally on Obadire, which I won't repeat because I don't even have it in front of me, I'm thinking about not just Jesus's call to the disciples. I'm thinking about not only uh, the fishing process, I'm, th I'm thinking about the nets. Right. And the net may be the institution to a large degree. I don't want to make that total e equation, but that's what I'm thinking. What What's in the net that needs to be tied together again? What's in the net that has to be unknotted so right. that we can get back to the boat and, and get to the work? Now, the, the other thing that I would say, and I, I'll, I will add this much, <clears throat> I have written about it on Obadiri. Jesus is talking to fishermen. Fish, so he says fish for people. I think he's going through vocation. I think if he'd been talking to doctors, he would have said, follow me and I'll teach you how to cure peoples in their exactly. spirit. Mm -hmm. He's talking vocation. Right. And my, my hope for the future of the United Methodist Church is we'll be a lay movement once again, where people will see their, their vocations, their day-to-day -day stuff that, what, what, do, what do fishermen know? They know how to fish. So what do lawyers know? They know how to lawyer. What do school teachers know they know how to teach as soon as we can can teach the wesleyan tradition of the gospel and say live it in the way you already know how to do we're going to see a new church yeah you know you're bringing back my childhood memories of both of my uncles and my grandfather through cast nets that was they always were fishing but always involved in her in their fishing. I remember long afternoons, usually rainy afternoons, where they would sit and mend their nets. It was tedious work. It was important work, and it was it was work that had to be done for the work to continue. I think you're I think you're onto something powerful. And it makes me think in the resurrection account where Jesus, um, where they he tells them to fish off the other side, and they have the huge catch of. 157 exactly. and that's all the known world this is your vision right, that's right. vision that's right. of all the known world and that the net was without and the greek word is schism right? that's right the vision that's is right. a big right. net full of all people without schism yeah. well the thing and i didn't mention it, the thing i didn't mention a good minute ago is Jeannie and I were walking at night. These fishermen, it, that's not to say you can't fish at night. It's just that they were mending their nets in the darkness, getting ready for the dawn. And so I, that's, mm. we've, we, we've been in a night. The nuns and duns are, are telling us, you've been church, you've been in the dark, you've been in the night. Right. And so I'm wondering, I, I'm, I'm not going to ask you a question as a bishop, but I think 
if I were running in the circles you run in, I, 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 and part of this is my fatigue, and you can edit any of this out that you want to. And it's not just business, but, but I'm hearing people who say, well, after general conference, I was asked, no, that's too that's late. Not, that's not, you yeah. can't wait. No, no. If there's net mending to be done, it's now. And if it's right. maybe those fishermen mended in the dark so they could be ready for the dawn. See, yeah. that that's what I would like to add to my net metaphor is maybe you fix your nets in the dark when it's right. when it's not a good time to fish. You said your, your uh, relatives fi fixed nets when it was rainy and whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Your net mending occurs not at the prime time, but the inopportune time. Right. And I, I guess I'm just getting a little tired of people say, well, after after general no, conference, we're no, going to do this no. and the board are going to be, man, we no. We started and yesterday. Yeah. Bishop, you know, you know, Bishop, Steve, what you're really. Let me just add, Bishop Sue, you may smile and say, Steve, we're already doing that. You just don't know. And and I'd be the first to say, yay, I'm glad. Yeah, yeah. One of the, what you're really talking about, Steve, I think, are disciplines. Oh, absolutely. You know, mending those nets, that's a, di that's a discipline that's a part of fishing. It's and, hard work. Uh, and I think they, so many people uh, have a misunderstanding of discipline. And I've always loved Richard Foster's image of the piano player. You know, unless a, per unless a pianist spends the time in practice running up and down the scales, you don't, you, unless you do that, you don't develop the muscle memory. In, in your fingers that enable you to do that. But when you when you discipline yourself, when you engage in disciplines like that, then you are able to release the music that's in you. Mm. Yeah. You can't there you have no mechanism to release that music unless you do that. I think our spiritual life is exactly like that. Yes, I Un too. unless we discipline ourselves and the Wesleys had time-tested ways of doing that. Immerse yourself in scripture. Engage in an ongoing life of prayer. Have fellowship with other Christians. And my favorite of them all, gather around the table of the Lord. Uh, receive Eucharist. Model your life after, you know, taking and blessing and breaking and giving. And yeah. when we engage in those disciplines of the Christian faith, not just Methodists, but all Christian, when we engage in that, we have a way to release the love that's inside of us. And I think that's the that's the goal. I, I'm sure we're kind of coming down toward the end of things. And a couple of other things I wanted to say, and I don't think they're in um, multiplying love exactly the way I'm going to okay. say them here. I don't really remember, to be honest. But the uh, the older the older I get and the longer... I do my best to be an apprentice of Jesus. You know, the, the longer I do this, two words just surface for me more important than any others. And we've talked about them here, I think, today without naming them explicitly, which is why I wanted to do that. The first is listen. Mm -hmm. We talk too much. Yeah. Yep. And as Steve was saying just a few moments ago, maybe we need to tune our ears you see, to the nuns and the duns. What what are they telling us? We need we need to listen. We need to put ourselves in a posture of attentiveness right. in order to be, I think, what God fully intends us to be into the future. And then secondly, the second word, hospitality. I think the Christian faith is just all about hospitality, welcoming people into a safe space. Um, and I and I've always loved Henry Nouwen's uh, playing with all with with these words hospice and hostis. You know, hostility is is rooted in that hostis. Hospitality is a hospital, a place of healing. Mm -hmm. So our communities, my hope is, in the future, will be places where divisions are healed, where brokenness is healed, where we're able to live together and celebrate diversity in the same way that God does. Right. Just look in the world. If, if, if you don't immediately intuit that God loves diversity. I've lived in Africa, so I've seen elephants and tsetse flies. Mm -hmm. yeah, if, if you don't understand that God loves this diversity, I don't know what you're seeing. Right. <laughs> I don't know what you're looking at. Right. Steve? 
final thoughts? Well, I'm just. I mean, we I'm, could go I'm, on all day. I love. Well, this. Yeah, <laughs> I'm. I'm overflowing with thoughts, uh, and as both of you know, I call myself a theological bat boy. I get to travel with the team, but I don't generally get to play. You know, a lot of the innings. And, and I'm practical. So I'm going to end at a very practical place for somebody who might be listening to this as a nun or as a done. It is complicated because we in the church have made it so. I would almost say to a person, stop reading all the stuff uh, and just go to a church next Sunday. And you may have to go more than once to discern what I'm about to say. But be looking for how they treat people they don't like or who they don't agree with. Mm. See, I think the future of the United Methodist Church, and I base this on a conversation I had with Eugene Peterson. We were email buddies for about the last seven or eight years of his life. But the first time I met him, it was here in Florida when he came to teach. We were talking and he said, Steve, I'm so tired of adjectives. They're killing the church conservative Christian, liberal Christian, progressive Christian, fundamentalist. He said, I am a Christian. And then after that, you can decide whether you like me or not. See, We've gone so far into partisanship today that we're cannibalizing each other. Um, you may remember back in 2014 when World Vision made a decision to offer insurance to their employees who were in same-sex relationships. Right. Within 48 hours, Franklin Graham had jumped on that and said, we will destroy you. So what I want to say to people and have said, in fact, is, I mean, you got to, I mean, if you're going to go to church, you got to go somewhere, but don't, don't, don't go uh, except to say, what am I picking up of how these people deal with differences? Mm -hmm. yeah. Now you can tell if they're cannibalizing each other. Or you can tell from the pulpit, you know, if somebody says, I was talking to a person who was in a church, that, uh, not, and this actually happened when the pastors said to the people, I'm going to stop. And if any of you don't agree with what I've said today, there's the door. And I hope I don't ever see you again. Hmm. Now, if you were visiting that Sunday, it doesn't take rocket science to say, I don't really think that's what I want to do. So I'm saying as we move into the future of the United Methodist Church, pay attention to how those of us who are staying UMC mm -hmm. treat people we disagree with. Mm -hmm. That's going to be a bellwether test because we're going to have people still right. in the United Methodist Church. Right. It's not going to be a one tune thing at all. We're going to have we're going to have difference still. Right. We're we're yeah, we're 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 now being absolutely. tested about how how we're going to treat one another. Um and we, yeah, we haven't I, done that. I, I totally agree. And I would say also look to the leadership. Absolutely. I mean, if we truly believe, here's the evangelical in me. Jesus says, how will you know if somebody's in mind? How will you know? By the fruits. That's and what right. are the fruits? Love, That's joy, right. peace, patience, gentleness, kindness, <laughs> faithfulness, generosity, and self-control. That's if right. Leaders in the congregation is not behaving and exhibiting the fruits of the spirit, especially especially about those they disagree with. I don't think it's, of, I don't think it's of Christ. I don't think that that's a reflection of who Christ should be. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I think back, Paul, and you, and I say this all the time, you know, you have those moments when something just sticks with you. And this was in Cambridge. I know Paul, a place you dearly love, but I was speaking with a fresh expressions, young pastor who was starting a house of prayer in Cambridge. And he told his life story. He had been all over, addicted. He had been a mess. He had been way far from God. And I said, well, how did you end up here? And he said, I found a group of people who knew Christ. And then I'll never forget this phrase. And they loved me into wholeness. Yeah, that's right. And mm -hmm. so I think, I guess all of us would agree that at the end of the day, anybody who follows Christ in any church should be a place that loves people into wholeness. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Yeah, yeah absolutely. absolutely. So, well, thank you both. I think we've covered a lot of ground, but <laughs> I respect you guys so much and I appreciate your witness. And I would say everybody read Multiplying Love, um, visit Obadiri, and you know what? Just 
read your Bibles in ways that aren't looking for rules. <laughs> read your Bibles and say, how is Christ behaving and how does he treat people who um, are far from God and follow mm -hmm. suit? So go and yep. do likewise. So thank mm -hmm. you both. And uh, I look forward to further conversation in the future, but I appreciate you. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Bishop. Bye-bye.